Hey friends, Lee Brown with Remax here, and it is time for Kicktail Part 2 Accountability Session. Hang tight with me for one second here while I get my screens all loaded up so that I can see what you have to ask me. So if you are new to the Lee Brown world of Facebook Live, hey, and remember that what we're doing here is based on my annual business planning session that I do on Facebook Live every year, which is called Kicktail. And in that program, I like to help you get some inspiration for the year. Well, one of the big things that's requested every year and we're finally doing it this year, is accountability. Because for some reason, we have a hard time reaching out to one another person to person to set up personal accountability. So we're just gonna do it as a group. And my screen looks really weird right now. So let's clear the overlays, hide all overlays so I can see y'all. Hey, that is not a clear picture. I wonder if it's clear on your end because on my end, it's very fuzzy. Let me look over here. And by the way, if you are not watching this live, don't feel bad. We miss you, but we know some of y'all actually had to go sell houses today. And my computer is ridiculously slow because I think it knows when we're trying to do things. It's still not clear. I don't know why the picture is not clear. Alrighty then. So I'm just going to go over here and watch the comments. So if you have a question, hey Nora, if you have a question or need something answered or you're stuck on something, now's your chance to ask. But the first thing I want to ask you is since the beginning of January, when you set a plan for 2019, and that plan could have been related to sales, it could have been related to profitability, could have been related to systems, it could have been related to your personal life, whether it's your relationships or it's your personal health and fitness, whatever those goals were, I want you to do me a favor and click like if you acknowledge that you had goals. Click love if you've hit any goal at all. So hit those little emoticon reaction things so I can get a feel for who set goals and who has actually achieved something. Because I think that's part of our challenge in life is that we don't give ourselves acknowledgement for setting goals. So you got to give yourself a like for even setting any. And then we also know that when we hit our goals, sometimes we're really hard on ourselves and we do not give ourselves credit for that. So I'd like to know what you've done that you give yourself credit for. So tell me something. What do you have to tell me right now? There's got to be something that you're proud of. And while you're thinking about that, I'm going to dig into some of the questions that were pre-submitted during this wind-up to our accountability day today. And the first thing is, if you don't know me, by the way, I'm a broker in Concord in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I've been a realtor for 19 years. And prior to that, I sold chainsaws and stocks and bonds and liquor. So my background is a little bit checkered, but I lean into that, and y'all need to lean into yours too. Oh, and by the way, I forgot something. As y'all say hey over here in the comments, my friend Brian Copeland in Nashville, Tennessee, gave me a great tip on Facebook. If you will go to your personal profile and go to the About page, you see where my page says I'm a Concord Realtor? It won't let me do the little R thing, and it won't let me capitalize it, so I'm violating the trademark, but it's Facebook's fault. So go over there and go to Details About You, and you can add in a nickname. And for me, my nickname is Concord Realtor, so I can remind people when they come to my page and see my name, that's my primary role in life, even though my role has shifted a lot into speaking. So go take care of that for yourselves, and then I'll see what y'all are doing from where you are. And let's see, I see, hey, I have shingles. Buddy, are you serious? You have shingles? Is that really on this same post? I think it is. Oh, no, that's on a different post. Oh, um, So I guess you better say a prayer for old Buddy West if he really does have the shingles because that would suck. Look, I just turned red because I'm talking about somebody else's medical conditions, but frankly, it's his fault for putting it on Facebook. So let me go back to what was submitted. And what I'll remind you is that other people's submissions absolutely could be things that you're dealing with because in this life, it feels really isolated and lonely. And that doesn't have to be that way because we are not in a light, lonely business. We get to deal with humans every day, but we're not so great to each other sometimes. So anyway, oh, hey, Scott Wendell, by the way, we just got one of Scott's Iowa buyers under contract. What? And then he gave me a name for somebody in Pella, Iowa, where Pella windows are from, if you didn't know. Okay, so he's going to be president of Iowa Realtors, and I get to install him. Ah, 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 ah. 
<laughs> so if you are an association leader person and you want to be installed in a way that nobody in your association has ever seen before, you should call me because Scott should totally be afraid right now. Okay, so anyway, first question received. I have just recently received my license. I changed your grammar for you, friend, because you said you recently got it. Let's just say you recently received it because that's way better use of the words because it sounds fancier because it's a big deal. It's a really big deal to get your real estate license, especially when you do something with it. Now, what this person said, this is a step of faith for me. So high five to anybody who takes a leap of faith and her business or his business, I don't know, is called Hearts Desire Services. It helps people organize and downsize. So you've got a business in a niche that is desperately needed and is growing. And actually, I have a partner in my area who has a franchise called Caring Transitions. And so if you do have a business like that and you want to grow it, you could look at franchises and see if they can help you expand more quickly. So she thought real estate would complement it and struggles with which part of it to continue if at all possible. All right, so friend, I don't know who you are because I don't have names on these submissions. So first of all, I admire you for not just starting one business, for starting two businesses because when you become a realtor, you are an entrepreneur and we don't give ourselves enough credit for how much faith and discipline it takes to make it in real estate. So you've now started two businesses and your question is, do you continue one, continue both or what are you going to do? The hard answer is this. Whichever one you want to do best, it's going to have to get all of you. It's going to have to get your focus. And what my suggestion would be, and this is not knowing anything about your market or what's happening in your life, you've already started a transition business. What if you put your real estate license in the holding pattern over here, keep it active, pay your dues, do your continuing education, get that transition business up and running, and as it becomes self-sustaining and you have some employees who can help and you have a system that's operating it, then you can start to weave in the real estate because as we all know who have survived in real estate, it takes an enormous amount of time and energy to make it as a professional realtor. So you do have a natural compliment there. You're helping somebody downsize. Handling the real estate is a benefit to them. But I think you should look at that as a service you provide and less of a full-time profession. I hope that makes sense. If you have more questions, reach out to me privately because I feel like you might need to talk through that a little bit. And we have somebody else who said, how do I reinvent a stalled 18-year career, 18 year career? So we're talking to each other here, friend, whoever you are. I'm having to reboot a lot of my business as well because since becoming a failed congressional candidate after running this year, I've had to really redo a lot with real estate, including redoing a lot of my messaging because it did confuse the public. Well, what is Lee Brown doing? Is she really still a realtor or is she now going to just run for any open political? Political office and the short answer to the second one is I don't know what I'm going to do next in my political life and waiting for God to open that window for me because he has not given me direction yet but in the real estate life I do have to get that message back out there so my suggestion to do is if you feel stalled do what I've been doing go knock on doors and it sounds scary actually really fun because people are super nice when they come to the doors and start calling your past clients I actually had a text from a past client night before last and it was an accidental butt text, but I'll still take it. And I replied back and I said, hey, how are you? How's your wife? How's things? Because they're still in the house that I sold them, right, a decade ago. And they said their son just bought his house or just moved. And I said, oh, is he renting or buying? You know, you know I'm your family realtor. And he said, oh, he used a friend. And I was like, ah. But it's my fault. I didn't keep up and keep the relationship going. So to unstall an 18 or 19 year career, you have to unstall those relationships too. So send some personal notes, make some phone calls, go knock on doors and get face to face. Last night I ate supper at a place I don't normally eat supper, but I ran into three past clients and was able to chat with them about not real estate. And one of them reached out to me today for a market evaluation. So get back out there and be visible in your community too. It all adds up. But I will tell you, first thing I'd say, personal notes and phone calls. Now, for those of y'all that don't know who to call because you get in your own way, y'all are professionals at that, I want you to go to your contact manager in your phone because most of you don't keep a good database. You pretty much suck at details, okay? And I love y'all, but you suck at details. And so what you do is you wind up getting a phone call coming in. You're like, I like this person, and let me save them. And then you save them in your phone, and essentially you've just become hoarders of people. So I want you to go to somebody in your list and call them. And I want you to say, hey, it's Lee Brown with Remax, although you should use your name in your company. And I want you to say, I was thinking about you. 
which is true because you thought about them when you saw their name, and then let them talk. I think too many times our relationships struggle because we want to tell them what we're doing. We want to talk about ourselves all the time, and we forget to let somebody else talk because they, too, want to talk about themselves, and maybe they really need to. Because what I should also mention is that in going to dinner last night at a different restaurant than normal, I went out with a past client who's had a lot of changes in her life, and I was actually super excited to hear her news, and she just needed to talk. And as realtors, it's not often that we do 10% of the talk and the other person does 90, but that's what they need. Frankly, it's going to feed you too. That's going to unstall things. And by the way, if you are a one-year realtor and you're thinking, that's fine, Lee Brown, you have a phone full of names. Shut up. You do too. You've got a phone too where you've been hoarding people. So call all of them and say hello. There's no better way to start lead generating than to talk to people. Okay, now maintaining enthusiasm of your team during busy summer season and with difficult or unreasonable customers. Now, I feel like one of my team members may have submitted this because our summer season has gotten busy as we've worked hard to get the message back out there that I'm available and the rest of my team has, of course, stayed available because they are amazing and they are actually probably better at real estate than I am at this point. Let's be super honest. So to keep enthusiasm up, first off, make sure everybody's taking days off and protecting their sanity. So I have one agent going on vacation. Well, she have two on vacation next week. And two weeks ago, we had somebody on a cruise where she was unavailable. So help your team members get unavailable. There's no better way to recharge yourselves, y'all, than to be unavailable. Think about it. Now, you know I have to jump into the Bible for just a second. Even if you're not a believer, I can introduce you, but think about it. Everybody knows the creation story and what happens on day seven. What does God do? Does God check emails and text and just do some busy work and clean up the day? No. What does God do on day seven? What's he do on the Sabbath? Somebody type it in. I'm waiting on a comment. Waiting on a comment because y'all know, and look, this is a lesson right here because I know there's a reason I want y'all to type it in. I don't see anybody typing. Somebody type it in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What did he do on the seventh day? Look, I can wait y'all out. I am a mother. I am professional at waiting you out. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Barbara gets a high five. Charla and Mary, look, ladies, you know this. You have to rest. That's how you maintain enthusiasm, not just for real estate, but you maintain it for life. Y'all, we do not give ourselves a day off, and in real estate, we're so bad about it because you tell yourself it's just a text, it's just an email, and what happens is that the minute you look at it, you have put yourself back into workspace, and you've lost focus on what really matters, which is you and the family that you love and the things that you love doing that have nothing to do with houses. So find a way, y'all, in the next 30 days, you won't give me one day a week. Give me one day. One day that we are going to turn it all off. Facebook will survive without you. Your clients can survive if you are the, especially the best kind of realtors. And I know that all of y'all are. What you're going to tell them is, I am unavailable tomorrow. Now, if your house is on fire, call the fire department. If an offer comes in, I've got somebody to handle it. And here's her name and her cell phone number and then have somebody that can cover you. So even if you're not on a team, you can use some of the best team practices by having somebody that covers for you because that maintains enthusiasm. The other thing that maintains enthusiasm is something I suck at because I forget and I'm a D personality who doesn't need it. I forget to pat people on the back and tell them what they do well because I'm really good at telling them where they don't do things right. So I have to work on that and that does keep enthusiasm up when you tell people, I see that you can do this well. Here's my vision of how it can happen better. But pat them on the back first and then go after what you need to have changed. And difficult or unreasonable customers, frankly, that's when you need a friend like Tina White, who's a Remax up in Asheville, who loves me enough to send me a bottle of nectarine and honey whiskey because honey's good for your throat, if y'all did not know that. That's how you manage unreasonable customers. The other thing you can do is what one of my team members did the other day. She told that client, you are not going to talk to me that way when he was just a yelling and told her four times in the same conversation. I'm not making this up, y'all. This person told her four times in the same conversation that I am the king. <laughs> We all still laugh around here at that, but when you have a client that really does think that, you have to reset the relationship if it's going to continue. And she told him, no, that's not how this is going to work. I need to explain to you the schematics of the market. And so she did, and they came to a meeting of the minds. Shut it down, okay? Now, next question. 
getting involved in real estate organizations, the process, what committees do I recommend, what organizations, local, state, or national? <gasps> That's like 87 questions and probably its own webinar, but I don't think y'all are interested enough in volunteering to hang out with me for an hour while I explain it. So here's the short story. The way that I did it is pretty much the wrong way where you just throw in to the national level before you look at state and local, because in reality, there is a hierarchy in real estate volunteerism that says you need to check the boxes locally and then go to the state and then go to national, which I, in my younger days, thought that was kind of silly. But in my medium years here of only Claire all knows years, it makes a lot of sense. And here's why. Locally is where your big regulatory actions are happening. It's where the MLS decisions are made for the most part, and it's where we really need to hear from you, the producing realtors. When you look at the high-level stuff, it matters too, but we really, really, really extra need a different focus on our local realtor association work. And in fact, this morning we had a company meeting and one of our brokers is a very involved in volunteer. And she stood up in front of the company and begged them to volunteer on MLS because we have a lot of top producers. So what I'll tell you is if you're a top producer, we need you in MLS world because that's where the bulk of the change and craziness is probably going to happen in the next three to five years. But outside of that, when you ask what committees to get started with, think about what you enjoy. If you are somebody who enjoys events and other members and volunteers, go do something with membership or events or the Realtor Expo in your market or those kinds of things where you can mix and match. Teach new member orientation. That's a wonderful way to give back in a volunteer way. And it's wonderful for our new Realtors to hear from you, the producers who are engaged, instead of just the same staff members who sometimes get stuck teaching it because they don't have realtor members who volunteer. State level, we need you on the state level, though, because our state associations also do a lot of regulatory and political work. North Carolina right now, we have a massively critical bill that's in committee that needs realtor input to the members of that committee. So the more involved you are with your elected officials, you should let your state know that. Know that you have a relationship with the person from the house because they can connect you to the place you belong. Maybe you dig forms. There's a forms committee in most states. Oh, maybe you love bylaws. Well, guess what? The governance committees would love to have you because most realtors don't finish reading anything. So the eight of you that read every word, we seriously need you to come help when it's time to review and revise bylaws and strategic plans. And by the way, those of y'all that can count should do audit budget finance committees because a lot of realtors, I love y'all, but you're terrible with money. You just kind of guess at it. That's not who should be on budget and finance committees. So those of y'all that know how to balance a checkbook, please sign up. What I'll tell you is this. If you sign up for a committee and you don't get picked, call the president-elect and say, I'd like to serve. And I applied for X and didn't get picked. Is there a place you didn't have any volunteers sign up? Where can I give back? If they tell you that you can give an hour taking registrations at the next event, do that. Because even giving back in small ways puts you back in face-to-face -face contact with other realtors, which makes your transactions go better. And by the way, when you're ready to apply for your state committees, then you should have some relationships locally that would tell you where you want to give back. If you want to do national, we'll open up that process again for committees in February of next year. I am glad to help y'all look through that list and know what the different committees and forums do because as a person in that leadership's area-ish, what I can tell you is that we really want to have more great members raise their hands and have expertise where they're raising their hand so that you're brains and your passion match up and that benefits everybody and we definitely need some new people uh, with new ideas and background okay helping a client so much that many hours are spent i love being able to assist but i only have 24 hours in the day oh you're letting somebody else run your business okay friend i need you to listen and i really hope whoever that is is on here Here's a big tip for you, and I've given this a couple of times, so if you heard it before, then you don't have to hang up on my Facebook Live. i got more to get to. Many of us schedule our days with our buyers, and we say, look, I can meet you at 1 o'clock, or I can meet you at 4 o'clock. What you never tell them is that you have a limited amount of time. Maybe in your schedule, the 1 is available until 1.45. And four is available until 515. Give an end point on your appointments. And what the buyers will then know is that they've got to operate within that time frame. Now, let's be realistic. When you go see the house and their eyes start sparkling and you know they're going to buy it, that's the point where you have to say to them, 
I may have to reschedule my next appointment if y'all want to buy it. And they're going to say, uh, yeah. So you go reschedule it, and then you can spend the time with them to write the offer. The other way that you can reduce the amount of time you're spending is do a better buyer consultation up front. And y'all, you need to be doing excellent buyer consultations where you explain agency, where you explain how agents are compensated. You talk about how multiple offers work. You explain the numbers in your neighborhood and the list price to sales price ratio because do your buyers know that making an offer 30000 under ask is going to lose them the house? Tell them that in the initial consultation because it saves tremendously. The other thing you can do to save some time is, I know you don't want me to say this, call the listing agent before you get there and just verify if there's multiple offers. As a listing agent myself primarily, those phone calls can be a little annoying because I might put the notes in the MLS, but they didn't go back and check it again. I get it. But reach out as much as you can to save your buyers from falling in love with something that they won't be able to get because it just went verbal. Okay, best methods for keeping engaged with past clients. Already went over this. Personal notes and phone calls. And I'll tell you, what we did just last week is we carried American flags to some of our top past clients. Just the, the little dollar one from Target. And, you know, just told them we appreciated them. And we're glad to be entrepreneurs in America. Do small stuff like that. I do love going to Target and looking in those little bins at the front of the store for ideas. And Brian Buffini's been a big fan of that Pop By series for years. And so you can make up your own. You don't have to buy it. But get out and knock on the door and get in front of them. Staying on track when I'm so busy with a local board, what I need you to do is, first of all, take a high five for volunteering for all of us. Because, y'all, when you volunteer at your local board, you're doing it for all realtors everywhere. And I appreciate you. And if everybody else forgot to thank you, thank you. I appreciate you. So here's what I want you to do. Get yourself a better calendar app and start chunking your day. If you're going to have a board of directors meeting, chunk your client calls in to the hour before you go and turn off the distractions, the emails, the Facebook messages, the text. Because a lot of times we can get more done when we're busier. Remember that from waiting tables? Any of y'all wait tables with me back once upon a time? And you remember when you had one table, you either haunted them to death or you vanished because you weren't really sure how to take care of them because you weren't busy enough. But then you'd have a section full of eight tables and you were crushing it. Everybody had a full tea glass and everybody's food came out hot and on time. No mistakes. You're like on it. Pre-bus. I mean, you're all over it. Because when you're busy, you learn how to schedule yourself better. So actually, our active volunteers are some of our best realtors because you're really good at compartmentalizing your time. But the problem we have is, frankly, these things. It's the text and the buzzing and the emails, and nothing's going to die in the space of an hour, okay? The other thing you have to know is that when you're busy with your local board, it's okay to say no if they're asking you to add one more thing to your plate. Sometimes, y'all, we forgot to say, I have enough. And enough isn't necessarily a negative thing. It means I appreciate what I have, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity, but I have enough. And that's something that I'm, you know, do as I say, not as I do, because I'm terrible at that, but I'm working on it. That's one of my big, giant mistakes in life is saying yes to everything. Okay, getting more into the listings and where to begin on practicing scripts. There's so many great resources out there. Of course, you know, I'm the past president of CRS in 2017, which feels like 183 years ago. But if you go to CRS.com, start working on that designation. And even if you don't have it yet, be a member. There are some actual webinars out there with scripts and dialogues. I've done some. Alexis Bolin has done some from Pensacola, Florida. A lot of realtors have great information they'll share. Go there because you can get them down in webinar chunks, especially if you're an independent realtor that you're not from a big company that has a lot of resources. The Remaxes, Keller Williams, Cobalt Bankers of the world tend to have online educational resources. There's probably some state saved in there. Now, what I'll tell you is that you'll be much better about scripts if you practice with someone. And think about how amazing it is to have Skype and FaceTime. Y'all could each make friends with each other and practice your scripts because they don't sound fake when you've practiced it enough. And that's one reason realtors don't use them is they say, I don't want to sound canned. Well, you won't sound canned if you've practiced it enough to where it sounds very very authentic because frankly it's just knowing the words in advance it's not that you're trying to slime anybody into anything you're just really being prepared uh, and getting more into listings you're gonna have to ask for them okay so when a buyer calls in that came in off your website ask them what are y'all gonna do before you buy are you currently renting or do you own something that you want to sell start asking that question earlier what I have found is that a lot of realtors don't ask I don't think you intentionally forget or you're scared to. I think you just you just forgot because you have ADD and 
We need some special realtor ginseng, I think. So why don't one of y'all get busy on that and you'll make a fortune. Okay. Ideas for getting into the higher price sales. Well, the first one is this. I'm, I'm going to have to preach for just a second because as realtors, sometimes we forget how much more valuable we are to the $100,000 client than to the $4 million one because that 100000 one doesn't have the foggiest idea what to do sometimes. And the high price one's probably been through it multiple times. So I'm going to ask that if you start to think about this as a strategy for increasing your income, just don't forget the smaller price range. And when they call in, don't be snooty. Okay, just promise you won't be snooty. Take the pledge. I won't be snooty. Okay, good. So now to get the higher price sales, you want to think about how you're interacting with that community. Are you eating breakfast where they eat breakfast and eating lunch where they eat lunch? If you're not, go find some local restaurants around that price point. Go knock on doors. Y'all, I was surprised when I was campaigning for Congress how many people came to the door. And it was primarily in the upper price range neighborhoods because that's where you have people that aren't necessarily dual income trying to hold the door zone and a lot of people were home during the middle of the day they came out and said hello so just be comfortable with who you are and the knowledge and expertise that you have sometimes y'all don't go to the higher price point because you don't live in a higher price point house and so you feel like they're better than you you're not you're pretty amazing and you have something that they don't have which is not just a passion for the real estate market but interest in the professional side and being an amazing advocate for them when they decide to do something so lean into that Okay. The other thing I'll tell you here is the right balance of assertiveness with clients. I get away with a lot with my accent, frankly. And so if you don't have a Southern accent, you probably shouldn't fake it because those of us that hear it, we know. But be, be able to use humor. Humor goes a long way in helping people know that you're serious. And so I use that to get the point across a lot of the time. And here's one example. You have a buyer with you and they have looked at every house on the market ever and they can't narrow it down they're like I like it I mean I still like it I don't want to take it off the list I might change my mind I might want to look at it a fourth time and see if it's the right house because they have trouble making decisions well this is an idea that came from somebody 20 years ago in the star power network and I can't remember who it was so if you know who it was then tell me and I'll give them credit because I don't remember anything after having children so anyway let's say you have MLS sheets in the car okay so here's two house sheets you go look at it. You ask the buyer. You're like, does this make the top three? And they say, no, it's like number five. Crumple it up. Throw it in the back seat. Now, what should happen is this. Your buyers be like, oh, I don't, I don't throw it out. I'm like, look, it's not in the top three. How many houses are y'all buying today? See, and that's kind of funny, but it's a real question because you have to be assertive enough to help them move to a decision. Now, I'll take this one and say, now, what y'all think of this house? Where is it ranked? Oh, it's number two. I'm like, well, well let's keep it then. And you can also set that up in your buyer consultation with we're only going to keep three houses in our list at any time. Once you crumple it up and throw it in the back seat, it's kind of amazing how mentally and visually they separate from that house right at that time. And it's really important for you to think about that. You don't have to be super fancy all the time. Sometimes just be real world. Crumple it up. Throw it in the back seat. Now, for those of y'all that don't put buyers in your car, reconsider putting your buyers in your car. I really don't know how you get to those intimate conversations otherwise. And if you're nervous about liability, make sure you have an umbrella policy. Every realtor should have an umbrella policy on yourself because of all the liability that we carry. Okay, creative ways to attract new business and prepare for the change in real estate as we know it. So attracting new business, what I'm doing right now is I'm focusing on other businesses. We've been doing a series for several weeks now of spotlighting other local businesses. I don't talk about Lee Brown. I don't talk about my Remax office. I don't talk about buying and selling houses. I showcase their business and I say, here's who they are. Here's where they are. Here's what they have and here's why you want to support them. Well, what's happening is we're getting really good feedback from the community. Community, and we just got a really great listing from that yesterday from somebody who really appreciated that we're spotlighting local business. So there's little things you can do that are just a little bit outside of your comfort zone. But again, this goes back to remembering that as realtors, you are local business. You're all entrepreneurs. And so when you think about supporting other people, by nature, they will want to support you, provided you are ethical and professional and somebody worthy of their support. So that's one thing you can do. The other creative way to get new business is to place outbound phone calls.
I don't know y'all think that sounds silly and like I'm making fun, but y'all don't place outbound phone calls. I know this. I look at your phones. You place text. You send emails. You don't call people because you're so afraid that they're not going to want to talk to you. Well, here's the beauty of it, y'all. In 2019, if they don't want to talk to you, they won't hit decline. And then you get to leave a voicemail and you can call somebody else. But go where other people aren't. We know that this is a classic piece of business advice, that blue ocean thing. Well, right now I do believe that the blue ocean is the telephone with outbound calls. So make some. Okay. How to scale up from 24 deals a year, when to hire the first person, and what role should they be? Look, I'm going to tell you what Sandra Nickel has told me and everybody else who's ever met that amazing woman from Montgomery, Alabama. The time to hire your first assistant is back at the first day you got in real estate. And a lot of us are afraid to hire because you're afraid of being responsible for somebody else's livelihood. But you need that help because the strength of a realtor is not in paperwork. The strength of a realtor is in relationship. It is in being the emotional guardian of somebody's largest financial instrument. And a great assistant is going to help you spend more time with clients. And so you've got people who can help you with DocuSign and Dropbox and chasing around an earnest money check and getting those details done, taking out signs and lockboxes. And then you can focus on making outbound calls and going on appointments. That's going to scale you up faster than anything. Now, I am going to do a webinar with CRS called Making That First Hire. So I'm just going to go ahead and plug that. If you are a CRS, you need your maintenance requirements anyway. If you're not a CRS, you can still take that webinar. But uh, insider tip, if you want to be a CRS, be a member first. And then you get member pricing on classes. So it'll pay for your membership. Okay. Conversion, improving on my contact to client relationships. This is a common problem in real estate. And in fact, it, this came up at our sales meeting this morning too, that we're afraid to be called salespeople. And the reason we're afraid to be called salespeople is because some of y'all are totally afraid to sell. Remember, sales is not making somebody buy something. Sales is helping somebody get to the decision-making point where they get what they want. And y'all, if they've called you about buying a house or selling a house, they want to do something with the house. They're asking you to help them get to the decision-making point. That's your job. You cannot sit back and wait for them to say, no, I mean, I'll let you know. And a lot of y'all, you tell, just let me know when you're ready to buy something. Let me know. Ah, no. So here's the best thing I can give you for buyers. And I was, again, taught this years ago and absolutely works. When you're talking to buyer clients, the first time you're meeting them in that consultation, let them know. Every house that we look at, y'all, I'm going to ask you if you want to buy it. Okay, do I have your permission? They're going to say yes. So now you walk into a house, and it is bad. It's bad. It's bad. It's not even so you, you're not even going to walk through the whole thing. Y'all walked in. You fix in to walk out, but you look at your buyers and say, y'all want to buy it? And they'll be like, what? Lee Brown, are you crazy? And you'll say, I told y'all I was going to ask. And they will say no. And then you're done with that house, okay? So you do this with every house, and you get to the right one. And you say, hey, y'all want to buy it? They're like, yeah. And then it's no longer you being salesy. It's you asking a question that they need you to ask. That's why they hired you, so that they can answer it. Then you can move them to the next steps. Think about it in that way. You are a guide and an emotional resource because this is a really emotional process. And if you don't help them move forward, you're not doing your job correctly. And it's also going to be hard for you to make a living in this business. All right. Oh, improving on those relationships. A lot of it is being more personal and less, hey, who do you know that needs to buy or sell a house? Which includes y'all's business cards, which make me tired. And I, let me see what I got on my desk here. I guarantee I have one that says... The greatest compliment you can pay me is a referral to your friends and family. Look, I got cards all over the place. Not, not an area one looks different from another one. They all look the same. Different colors, different companies. And the sad part is I look at these and I don't know who y'all are. Like, who you are. So think about your best client relationships. What do you know about who they are? You know, their kids, their hobbies, their jobs. Some little quirky thing about them. You ate lunch with them. You know something cool. Bring that into your relationships. Take care of people. When I was on Friday night, I was not, I don't usually do real estate on Friday night. Most of y'all don't. You know to turn it off. But I'm helping a good friend that I grew up with. And her parents need to sell the house because they've got Alzheimer's in the family. Well, they're in town moving. And when you're in town packing up your parents' house, that's really emotional stuff. So I made supper for them. And I piled my daughter in the car, and we rolled over to the house, and we carried them supper. 
that's how you improve client relationships, y'all. It's not always about the sale. It's not about the amount of money you're going to make, and it's not about the speed at which you do things. Sometimes we get so wrapped up in what we think a realtor is supposed to be and what the media told us a realtor is supposed to be, we forget the relationship's the best part. Had a closing that happened in May. I wasn't able to be there because of a commitment. And so the week after closing, I took that seller out to lunch. And frankly, we spent about three hours at lunch because we had a fine time. And she wasn't upset that I wasn't at closing. And she was so grateful that I took the time to sit down with her and say thank you. And it reminded me that I don't do it well all the time. I have to do this more, which is why I'm getting better at this because I've let a lot of stuff go. I've let a lot of my great relationships whether on the vine because I've been unfocused in my business, which is why you will be seeing some announcements from me within the next several months about some new projects and some things that I will be stopping doing as I figure out where I need to spend Lee Brown's time. And I'll tell you, after the last couple of client interactions and eating with people and fixing them food, I, I need to fix some things in my life to make my relationships better. Best tips for keeping employees positive and motivated. I mentioned this before. Love on them, even if you don't want to do it anyway. And we have a question here about how helping with RPAC fundraising. The biggest thing I can tell you all about being involved with RPAC is that, A, it matters. Because if we don't speak up on political, regulatory, legislative issues, nobody speaks for our clients. They have no voice. They're just one of them. But there's 1.3 million of us. And so when you're thinking about how you can get other realtors involved with the pack, you have to help them understand that what we're doing primarily revolves around policies. North Carolina right now mentioned it before. We have this issue with short-term rentals, also known as Airbnbs. They are looking to do things that would be an imposition on property rights. And I don't know about y'all, but I have some clients that rely on that Airbnb money to pay the bills. If that's taken away from them and I didn't speak up, I've hurt people that I serve. So the first thing you can do in helping with fundraising is understand local and state issues where you are. The second one is tell other realtors because, frankly, the reason a lot of them don't invest in our political work is that they don't like politics because it's ugly and gross. And then maybe we've supported a candidate or an elected official they don't like. But remember that when the realtor pack supports somebody, it's because we know what they believe about the issues that we're involved in and how critical that is. Okay, let me jump over here and get the rest of the questions. I hope y'all are submitting what you need. And let's see. What do I require of my buyer agents to keep them accountable? Okay, so Nancy, Nancy, this is Nancy Presley Lewis. You know what, Nancy? Let me raise my, my cup of coffee to you here. And, and I did buy Starbucks today with my rewards points, not with money. I'm kind of mad at them right now for disrespecting the police, but I'm not going to let my report, reward points go because I paid for them. Nancy, you're going to have to let go of the control. And I know, I know that's hard to do because I have had trouble in the past. And when I was a worse team leader than I am now, and Lord knows I've got a lot of improvement to make, but... I was awful 10 years ago because I wanted to know the outcome of every single thing. And I was squeezing people and micromanaging and they'd all, of course, quit and leave. And who could blame them? Nobody wants to work under that. So the way I look at it is this. I keep them accountable by, first of all, making myself available and by being available to their needs. And so I try to text and check in and pass off leads. And if I don't get a response in a timely manner, that's my red flag that something's wrong. But if they respond, I know they're doing their jobs. And frankly, in the low inventory environment, we can't really, we can't squeeze water out of a rock. Only the Lord can do that. And so you just got to be available, make sure they're working and see where you can tap in and help. So I was advising one of mine night before last, she's having a challenge with some scripts and we worked through it so that she can take her next steps. So be available is the first thing I tell you. The other thing I'll tell you is that we do have a Google sheet that runs internally. So when an incoming inquiry comes in, we can plug it in and then everybody has access to it so we can see how many times they've been touched and where they came from, which helps you keep from forgetting about following up with people. Y'all, I placed a buyer referral last Wednesday on the 3rd. And that name of that realtor, it was in a small market. I don't know. I reached out to another friend and she said, this guy might be all right. Didn't know too well, but knew of him. So we said, we'll give him a shot. Texted him, gave him the buyer's information. Come yesterday, a week later, 
He had the gall to reach up in here and ask for the phone number because he couldn't find the text because he said he had been on vacation. Like, that's pretty terrible in the way of accountability. And so that's why we have this running internal sheet. It's nothing fancy. And frankly, I used to have Boomtown, but I quit because the $1,500 a month I felt was too much for a back end, even though it's very pretty and fancy. And I know some realtors get great benefit out of it, but it was too much for us. And so we use a Google sheet. And the tracking that I do is of closings. I'm looking to see where our closings come from so we know where to spend our money. Let's see where our, how do I see all the comments? 36 comments. What are y'all asking over? Yeah, I can't stand it when I'm trying to do this thing across two screens. There's Joe Kenny saying hello. Oh, there's Dick Chittum. He's done so much for this business. Let's see. Do, do, do. I, I might have to have Michelle email me any of the comments that are coming in because I can't see them. Okay, well, while we're while I'm talking amongst myself to y'all, mm. if you did not know, we did National Ethics Day last week. That's one of my big wins so far for this year is that we did pull off the second annual. I guess it's the first annual because that's how those words work. But the second one of our National Ethics Day and for it not being the requirement year, we did really well. We raised $20,000 for Realtor Relief. I might even be 22 right now, and I'm pretty proud of that. So next year, we're hoping we can get to 60 or 100 as we get more associations on board. I did find out that a lot of associations don't want to participate because they make a lot of money on their ethics classes internally, and I personally think that we should offer as many classes as possible in as many venues as possible to reach as many members as possible. Okay, let's see. So, by the way, if you're interested in having your ethics training live streaming with me all at the same time next year, you can leave a note and we'll get your association signed up and make you part of this giant fundraiser for Realtor Relief, which we all love that foundation that know about it. And I'm totally killing time here as I try to figure out how to see the comments, but I can't see them on the page because it just says there's a top fan and I don't know how to see all the comments. I think it's because I'm using Ecamm Live. Oh, by the way, if you missed one of my little videos, my Instagram channel has a lot of my training videos on IGTV. And we're trying to put more and more subtitles in our videos. I'm using a program called Zubtitle for that, Z-U-B-T-I-T-L-E. And the cool thing about Zubtitle is, first of all, it's very cheap. It only works in Google Chrome, though, FYI. And then when you load up your video, it dumps your transcription on the screen and you can go in and edit it, which is helpful because I have discovered that I speak pretty much in one giant run-on sentence. But when I write, I don't write that way. Okay, so let's see. Oh, Lainey, I'm glad you made it. Hey, Old Dominion, I finally found the comments. Ah, okay. Oh, Grace has changed brokerages and she's got a broker that's willing to invest in her. Hey, high five, Grace. That's so hard. Realtors, you hate changing brokers because you have a massive amount of inertia. And sometimes y'all think you're going to be able to change that broker to something you want. But you know what? That's also why marriages fail. Y'all marry somebody thinking you're going to change them. Mm, you're not going to change them. You're going to get what you're going to get. Let's see. Kay Hightower completed a video challenge, and she's been working on her Facebook presence. Good job. I wonder if you did the one that Marky Lemons right how put out there because Marky's an amazing broker who out there is instructing, doing really cool things. And she's done a video challenge with Carrie Little out of Chicago. So high five on that. And I'm going to remind y'all again because it came up again today. It comes up all the time. And in fact, I made a lady start crying yesterday, which I'm pretty much sure is one of my main talents. I make y'all laugh and I make you cry. And I was making a video of her in my small business showcases. She did not want me to put her on video. And I said, why? And she said, oh, you know, my face, my hair. And she starts talking about all the things that she thought were wrong with her. And so I had to remind her that nobody has ever told her that she is less beautiful than she is or is the wrong size or the wrong height or says the wrong things or just isn't as great as I think she is. And she started crying because I think we forget to tell each other that there's something amazing about every human that we've met. Now, granted, some people are complete and total jack legs, and I'm not taking that away from them because I think they enjoy being jack legs, but... Most of the people that I've met in the real estate space who have all these little questions, there's somebody beating you up, and it ain't me, and it ain't your clients. It's you, and you've got to stop it. The cool thing about video, y'all, is you'll make a video, and you'll send it to somebody, and they're going to look at it, and they're going to say, I love her. Oh. You don't get that with a text. And when you do it on Facebook and you tell people something, hey, here's a house, hey, here's some grass, I mean, it doesn't really matter what you say. 
just say something. People love you. And the big tip I'll give you on video is don't watch it again. I never go back and watch my videos because I can't stand how my hair looks. I can't stand how my face looks and I can't stand how my voice sounds. And as of right now, I'm trying not to stare at the fact that my bra strap is hanging out and I can't get it to stay in. So pretty much don't judge me for that. All right, let's see. Uh, Tammy is glad to have reminders and calendars. Amen, sister. In fact, that's one of our challenges as a team right now is that with me coming out of political campaigning, testing the waters on that. Well, I didn't test them. I jumped all the way in, y'all. So coming back out of that, I keep generating like a thousand ideas a day. And I like to throw those at people and expect them to happen. And that's not a really good way to manage your team, by the way. So today I gave a little more structure, which is going to help. Calendars are part of that structure. So I will tell you that this, with you're thinking about how you're going to do better with social media, you need a calendar presence to tell you what to do. And one thing that I am working on is better pre better presence on LinkedIn. And I've discovered by doing some research that you need to publish at least three different things on there. So make yourself a publisher. So when you go to LinkedIn, and y'all should be excited about this because you don't know what to do either except post the same tired open houses and crap on there. So go over there and start writing and you can publish something. A couple of paragraphs is enough. Just talk about maybe your market. Talk about the front half of 2019 and what you've seen in the way of trends. What have you seen people doing for upgrades? What have you seen people asking about the iBuyers? And just talk about what you're telling people. Make it a post and publish it. Once you publish three, you get increased visibility on LinkedIn, and we're starting to see some real results from that work. You can also do video on LinkedIn, so that's where I'm posting some certain pieces of information, but you also have to know where to post what, so I don't put listings on LinkedIn. They belong on my team pages, and I don't put them over here on my speaker page because Frankly, y'all aren't here to hear about the houses I have for sale. You're over here because you'd like to have some a, a friend, frankly, in real estate that will, I guess, kick you in the butt sometimes and make you laugh and maybe give you an idea. I really don't know why y'all are here. You tell me sometime if you want to because I forget sometimes what I need to do day to day. I, I will do National Ethics Day. Columbus does need to sign up, Tammy. We tried to get them all to sign up. Iowa rocked. Let's see. Two more questions that came in. Can using a virtual assistant be a good investment? Okay, so look. This is the Lee Brown belief on things. So you can disagree with me if you want to, but I'm right. You're on my page. I've used virtual assistants in the past, and there have been some really great people who've helped me with my business here domestically. But the older I get and the wiser I get about spending my money, what I know is that if I hire local people, I'm better off because A, I'm helping my local economy. B, I am empowering local humans to do things to help my business grow, which means that the third thing I'm gaining is more advocates for the Lee Brown team at Remax. When you have a virtual assistant that's three time zones away, it sounds cool, but they're not part of your team culture and they're not part of your company and they're not part of your community. And so they don't know that there was a giant storm on July 4th night, you know? So start thinking about how that person that you hire, whether they're five hours a week or 40 hours a week, should be part of your team culture and that you've got to help them grow while you help yourself grow and that you can have them do a lot of the stuff. Now, granted, a lot of my work is done online and at home, and that's cool because I don't see a couple of my girls very often, although I'd love to. They can work at home, and I am paying more. They make a lot more money than I would pay a virtual assistant. But as I learned the phrase from Kyle Killebrew out there in the middle of the country, and I never can remember if Kyle's in Indiana or Illinois. Don't shoot me if the I states confuse me. I always know Iowa, though, because I lived there, but the other I states. Kyle said, don't step over dollars to get to nickels. And a lot of us do that in this business. You go the cheapest route instead of the best route, which is another reason I stopped buying our print goods online and started buying it from a local print shop because that local print shop is now sending us business. And so start thinking about things in a more locally focused way, and that's where I would go with the virtual assistant piece. Okay, new construction marketing ideas. Well, I just did a video of a new construction piece and did a walkthrough of the house. And what's been helping us is we do a lot of educational pieces online. And if you go across all my different platforms, you can start seeing a lot of the stuff that I do. Because not everything, again, cross post everywhere. And trying to educate people is a good idea with new construction. Because you want to think about 
how buyers can get super excited about one piece of new construction. Y'all know what they get excited about? It's the model. They don't get excited about a house in framing because most humans can't visualize. And in fact, the number is that it's estimated 15% of the public can visualize, which means all the framed houses in the world don't mean squat to them. It's going to be done in October. They're like, I mean, what? Because they don't know how long it takes to dry in a house and set the floors and order the cabinets and all those things. So be the person who's got those kinds of information available. And think about how the smell of sheetrock is so seductive to people. And I think one of y'all should invent an air freshener that smells like sheetrock. They made a new car smell one, and that seems to be working out well. Um, but I would say, again, I'd say video, video, video. And if you're doing a house that's already been built somewhere, do a Matterport of that floor plan. And of course, with all your caveats that this is not the actual house, this is a sample representation, give them something they can touch and feel because it's, it's just hard. That's why as realtors, we love spec homes because our buyers love specs. Builders don't like them because they're a financial drain. So work with your builders on saying, look, get me one spec. I can sell eight houses. Okay, let's see. Tammy has a question. Listing coming in that is in a major traffic construction zone. How do I market that or do showings? Traffic doesn't stop until after 6 p.m. One lane road with 17,000 cars a day. Um, I mean, could you hire a crossing guard to get somebody in and out? Is it a neighborhood or a driveway? So you start thinking about this. We know that historically with real estate, when road construction is happening, prices get dampened because buyers can't visualize. And so to that buyer, they're thinking, holy crap, there's going to be construction here forevermore, and I will never again be able to get in or out of my driveway when that's not the real world. So is there a possibility that your seller can wait until this construction's done? If they can't, you may have to do a price adjustment for it because... We look at prices historically. They're down around construction. Construction finishes, they come back. But, uh, yeah, I, I think I'd probably put in the showing instructions. Be very clear to your fellow realtors. There's a lot of traffic here. Plan accordingly. Plan your time schedule for showing. Plan your time frame to leave. Buckle up. Carry an insurance policy. Be smart and help them know. In fact, with my MLS papers, I would include a link to the DOT site, Tammy, that shows the time frame for that project because a lot of realtors are unfamiliar with how the projects are listed on DOT websites, and you could be a real help to your colleagues by telling them where to get the information. Let's see if anything else came in. I really think y'all didn't need a whole lot of accountability. You just needed some love today and to come say hey. So I'm glad that you did. And if you have a question you want to submit, toss it in right quick before I hang up the internet here since I can't hang up the phone. Although somebody got tickled at me yesterday because I was on a Skype call and I picked up my phone and they saw that it has a cord on it. That's my desk phone and I enjoy it very much. Thank you because I'm an old person and I have a landline at home too. So yeah, don't make fun. Oh, Kathleen, I appreciate you too. So let me just leave y'all with one thing here. Our world is a little mean right now, and I've experienced a whole different side of life this year. So I can tell you this from a lot of different standpoints, and I just don't think enough of us are doing nice things for each other. So that's why I posted on Facebook a little bit ago, I need to send some notes to some people, and I didn't know who might need one. So you can always ask, who do you want me to send something to? But look, this handwritten note that I got today has like six lines on it, and it's in cursive. Extra credit for cursive. Send somebody a note today before you finish your day. I don't care if it's your mama or your first, fourth grade teacher or your client who bought a house last week. Do something kind for somebody real quick. And it doesn't have to be about you. And my challenge to you is do not put your business card in the envelope. Send things to people who don't need to have a business card from you to know who you are. And let's all just make real estate a little bit nicer. And by the way, before we come back to Kicktail for 2020, I need to know what you need. So tell me how I can help you because I love helping. And sometimes I'm lost for what y'all might need that I could be helpful with. And second of all, mark your calendars for January the something. Michelle's going to put out the word as soon as we know what our date is. But 
before we get to January, finish your C2EX, your commitment to excellence. It's a new program from the National Association of Realtors. It takes your good behavior up a level. And I'll be honest with y'all, I thought I knew almost everything because I'm super over-engaged in real estate on many different fronts, whether it's the advocacy side or the volunteer association side or the selling side. And I made lots of mistakes and had to go back and do some relearning sessions. It was amazing. So take your C2EX and then post that out there and show people that you're doing something a little bit above and beyond. And for those of y'all that need a juice for the rest of the year, if you go take that little online class, and it'll take you a couple of hours to do the baseline. You can go back for hour after hour of that. It'll give you something to post that will get conversation going maybe amongst your buyers and sellers and be something different to take into a listing appointment. And speaking of something different to take into a listing appointment, if you've not gone to our Facebook page from our National Code of Ethics Day, there are graphics on there that my team made that you can put into your listing presentation so that you can explain the difference between a realtor who is bound by the Code of Ethics and just an average everyday realtor who got their license and is cruising. So that would also help encourage the other kind of realtor to take their game up a notch. So anyway, we're short of an hour, but I'm out of questions. I hope that this helped you go back and think about your year a tiny bit, but mostly help you think forward. I don't like to lean on the past. I like to lean forward. So that's what we're doing right here. rest of this year is ahead of us, and we can do really great things for ourselves, for our profession, and for our communities. So go do something good. Do your kind act before the end of the day. And whatever you need, that's what I'm here for. I haven't seen all y'all in person before, but just know this. I love you, and I'll do anything I can to help you. Until then, we'll see you next time.